Good day, everybody. Wherever you are, in whichever time zone and region you are, the setback of such an event is that we do not interact personally. The advantage is that it brings us together from all parts of the world without traveling. I'm the current president of EADI, and it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you all for this first EADI Distinguished Guest Lecture, presented by Madhura Swaminathan, who is in Bangalore, and we hope that the power situation will not cause any unforeseen interruptions. EAD stands for the European Association for Development Research and Training Institutes. As the name says, it's an European Professional Association for Development Studies. It has more than 100 institutional members in about 25 different European countries. While we are a European association, we try to overcome Eurocentric perspectives in global networks, seeking to link up with topical issues and scholars from the global south, from the north, in search for a new notion of so-called development, critically investigating and exploring alternatives to that dominant hegemonic notion of development, which since the era of enlightenment was not only Eurocentric, but also with a universal claim. We hope that we are able to provide modest contributions to a different view on the world, which also extends beyond the sustainable development goals, which at a closer look tend to reproduce the established traditional notions of development. We aim at more, and we aim so in collaboration and with alliances of the Global South. And it's an excellent opportunity to have Madura as the first distinguished guest lecturer in this series, while at the moment when you switch on the news, basically daily, we are confronted with the social struggles of Indian peasants against the agricultural policy imposed on them by the government. This is also what development is all about. And the forthcoming international conference, which takes place every three years, and this time in The Hague in July, between EAD and the Institute for Social Studies, not by accident, has the thematic umbrella of solidarity, peace, and social justice. These are three of the core notions we in EAD try to live up to. And everyone is welcome to visit our website. You just type in EADI in capital letters and then you should immediately get connected to the EAD website. Then you can get further details on what we are doing, what the Secretariat based in Bonn is doing, and I wish to welcome Susanne and Christiane and Basile, who are basically the heart and engine of EAD in Bonn. Then you can see our newsletter, you can subscribe to the newsletter, you can see our blogs, you can see our vibrant debate about a variety of notions. And I hope you can find out that what I just said, what EAD tries to aspire is indeed what we are living up to measured against your perceptions. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand over to Elisabetta Basile herself, for a long time, a EAD member of the executive committee who will moderate, introduce Madura, and will then also be the discussant. I hope that you will not only join us for this first EAD Distinguished Guest Lecture, but that you also join us in the future for the Distinguished Guest Lectures to come. And thank you very much to both Madura and Elisabetta and the EAD Secretariat for making this happen. Thanks, Anning. Thanks for your, your introduction to the lectures. My job is to introduce Madura Swaminantan, 
She is professor and head of the economic an uh, analysis unit in the Indian Institute, uh, Statistical Institute in Bangalore. And uh, she is also chairperson of the uh, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation in Chennai. She has a, a doctorate in economics from Oxford University and uh, has worked on the issue of food security, agriculture and rural development for over 25 years. She has written 10 books and a huge number of papers. Among the, the books should be included the Weakening Welfare, the Public Distribution of Food in India, How Do Small Farmers Fair, Evidence from Village Studies in India uh, in 2017, and Women at Work in Rural India in 2020. She was a member of the Government of India, India's High Level Panel on Long Term Food Security a two-term member of the Board of Governors of the International Potato Center, CIP, 2002-2008, and on the Committee of Development Policy of the United Nations, 2013-2015. She was a contributing author of the HLPE report on multi-staker uh, stakeholder uh, partnership to finance and improve food security and nutrition in the framework of the 2030 agenda. So I'm very happy to give the floor to Madura for her seminar on the agrarian challenges in India. Uh, please, Madura. Uh, I don't uh, see. If no, good morning, good, good afternoon, afternoon, everybody, and Professor Henning Melba. Thank you for introducing the series. It's an honor to be here. And Elisabetta for a very generous introduction. As we speak today, the uh, farmers' protests in India have entered their 85th uh, day. And by all calculation, this is the biggest mobilization that has been seen in India, the biggest protest movement after independence. While the large majority of people who are actually out on the streets are from the three northern states of uh, Punjab, Haryana, and Western Uttar Pradesh, there's been huge support, public support, and support from farmers across the country. And I think what that says is that there is something underlying. There are issues, there are problems in the agrarian economy. And that is why we see such a large and continuous mobilization. In my understanding of studying the Indian economy, particularly the rural and the agrarian economy, there are really three major challenges and that underlie these protests in large part. The one is the problem of low productivity or low yield. The second, and of course, these are interconnected problems, is the crisis of low incomes from agriculture. And the third of mass unemployment, uh, especially among women. Some of you who study women workers, I know they're in this audience, there's a discussion about why women's participation in work is low and declining. In our understanding today, a very big reason is lack of suitable employment. So women withdrawing from the workforce. I'm not going to really address the unemployment issue today because that's a lecture of its own, but I'll try to speak about the productivity uh, issues of agricultural production, productivity, and income. Now, I think it's useful sometimes to take a long perspective, a historical view. And I'm going to begin with a graph uh, which looks at the growth of agricultural output, value of output Q, and output per unit of area and output per unit of population over the 100 year period. And uh, this is the graph, I hope it's visible to all of you. 
agricultural output means value of all output, therefore it's in value terms, at constant prices from 1901 to 2003, so over a century. And this graph is taken from a paper by Professor Kurosaki, economist at Hitotsubashi in Tokyo. And in fact, he has very similar graphs, Pakistan and Bangladesh, etc. neighbors look almost the same. And I think if we take a long view, what we see here is the first 50 years of the last century, the 20th century, from about 1901 to 1950, whichever graph you take, it just remains more or less along the same line. This 100, there's hardly any growth of output. And in fact, there's a small decrease, therefore, in growth of output per person and per unit area. So those graphs are slightly declining, whereas output is more or less the same with fluctuations. And if you look at the next 50 years, the mid after we gained independence in 1947 from 1950 to 2000, I hope you can see the end of this graph and it's not uh, blocked by my view, by, by speaking here. There's no doubt the graph at the top, which is output, Q or gross value of output, has shown a remarkable rate of growth. And I think I take hope from this because as we enter the 21st century, or we've done one decade of it, I think there is, although we have problems as we'll discuss, given what we see of the last century, we had a very long period of stagnation. And then we had definitely a period of growth. And I think I want to emphasize this because very often we have today criticism, green revolution, discussion as though everything that happened in Indian agriculture over the last 50 years was on the wrong track. And personally, I think that's a very uh, one-sided view to take. We can afford to take that view today. There have been problems with the green revolution. We we'll put them on board today. But I think we also have to take this perspective, a long perspective of what has been achieved in India in the field of agriculture output and production after 1950. Just a minute more on this graph, because I think it's much easier to explain with this than with a lot of tables and numbers, is the dotted line, which is output per person, has more or less remained unchanged. But the line in the middle, which is you know the less darker line, is uh, maybe I can show it. This line, which is output per unit of area or productivity, has also grown. And given our problems with land scarcity, as is the case for many countries, it is really this, it is productivity per unit of land that we need to focus on. And that's what I'm going to be talking about shortly. This table just gives you a summary of what was shown in the graph, which is that we had output growing at half a percent per annum for the first 50 years, and then at about 3%, 2.7% per annum for the next 50 years. And the key change here, because area growth was limited, the key change comes from an increase in productivity or output per acre. I know this is a mix of scholars who know a lot about India and others who may be less familiar. So I want to briefly now bring you up to date to the most recent period. If you look at agricultural growth in the last 50, 60 years, uh, in fact, the first very good study on this was by Mohan Rao and Serva Storm. There's a very clear, there's a pre-green revolution period, early green revolution, and then a late green revolution or when the green revolution spreads. So let me just show you this. You don't have to go into all these numbers, but for those who are interested, we just need to look at the last row here. And we can see that in the early years, the early green revolution, a pre-green revolution, 
the first 15 years after independence, what is output grows at about 3% per annum, but a good part of that is coming from growth in area, expansion in irrigation, and therefore growth in gross cropped area. As we go on to the greed revolution period, we see that the main contributor to growth of output is yield. And that, that is emphasizing the point I'm making that eventually we will have to rely on yield or productivity as there is limited area available. And in the late green revolution period, yield growth becomes even more important. If you look at the post-independence period, the first three phases of growth uh, are pre-green revolution, then we had the green revolution, which was of course limited initially to wheat, then to rice, and also limited to certain regions of Western India, Northwest, and then it moved to Eastern India and Southern India, and moved to other crops, rice, and then later to oil, seeds, and other crops. If we look at the last 20 years, so if we start from 1991, there are two or three important uh, features to note. And I think uh, I'm, I'm spending a little time on this because I think to understand where we are today and what needs to be done, it's useful to have a bit of this history. So if we go back to this slide, which is the periodization of agricultural growth in India, if you look at phase four, which is from the late 80s onwards till the late 90s, if you like. It's a period of crop diversification. We start seeing an increase in oil seeds, in non-food crops, in fruit and vegetables. So we have diversification out of seed and out of food grain. Then, as you all know, India, like many other countries, phase of liberalization of economic uh, policy started in the early 1990s. It actually started in the mid 80s, but was accelerated in the early 90s. And as far as agriculture was concerned, there is no doubt that liberalization was a period of reduction in public investment in agriculture, whether it is in irrigation or whether it was in other kinds of infrastructure, whether it was in agricultural research and extension. And as I will show you in a minute, in a few minutes in a graph, it's not surprising that this neglect of agriculture, this decline in investment in agriculture shows up immediately almost in a absolute fall, very sharp fall in agricultural growth in the late 80, late 90s, I'm sorry the late 90s and from the mid 2000s realizing that that there will be had a, a disaster because of liberalization there have been some steps which were taken uh, to reverse this not in all dimensions as i will discuss but in some areas like rural credit has been um, policies of uh, expansion of rural credit agriculture were put in place so to just show you the last three phases on this graph, if we start, you can see that this 80s is a period of slow and kind of steady expansion of growth and a period of crop diversification. And a large part of the increase in value of output is now coming from non-food crops, which are higher value in many ways. But then you see that from this 1998-99 almost till 2004, I don't know if you can see me pointing my marker here, this was a period of a huge decline. And for some of you who are interested in uh, politics as well, this was the period 1998 to 2004 was the first BJP government, the NDA government. And that was the first period when it was nationwide it was recognized that we are in some kind of agrarian crisis and then steps began to be taken some steps at least uh, to find out what the crisis was about and how to address it 
So now let me move on to one of the sort of major points I want to make today, and which is, I think, somewhat neglected in the literature today, and that is the problem of low yield. The question of yield has become even more important today, given the discussion on climate change and how potential crop yield is going to be affected. As a matter of fact, there are very few studies in India. A large part of the climate modeling is based on studies elsewhere. But nevertheless, there are going to be clearly effects on potential yield in India as well. What the point I want to make is that even without looking at climate and its climate change and the increasing problems that are going to emerge, yields in India are much below potential. Yields in India are below what has been achieved in labs in India. So what, you know, the field stations or the agricultural universities. Yields are much below, the average yields are much below what we see in other parts of the world. And I'll just uh, come to this table in a minute. Yields within India also, there's a huge variation between, if you like, the best in the district and the worst. So the best, even within villages that we have studied, you see huge variability in yields. So there is a huge potential for increasing yields. And I'm not going to go into all these, but this is for rice and wheat. The biggest producer of wheat is China. It's first in the world, India second, and the US is third. But when we look at the yield levels, I didn't realize France has such high yields. France is showing up as number one. And then you have China, the US, and then India comes the far fourth at 2.8 per hectare. Uh, again, if we look at rice, Vietnam and China, I mean, even Bangladesh, much higher yields. In fact, Bangladesh is much better than India on many parameters. Uh, I was surprised when I look at this data that even in agricultural rice yield, the average for Bangladesh is actually much higher than for India. Uh, so even if you don't look at the US, if you look at comparable countries like Bangladesh in the case of India, we can see that with the existing technology, the average yield in India, there's still a gap between what is being achieved elsewhere and what is being achieved in India. Now, Professor, this table and the next few tables are from Professor T. J. Raman and his student Isaac Manna, who've been working on yield gaps crop-wise and agroclimatic zone-wise for different crops and regions of India. I don't want to spend much time, but you can see that if you look at different, even within India, you have a yield gap if compared to the high districts, you have a huge yield gap in different parts of India. So the green is the highest yield and all relative to that, the dark red is the highest gap, 75% below the highest yielding district. And you can see a similar pattern is coming for wheat. The green are the top yielding districts and the wheat growing northern parts of India. Uh, you can see that there are some, particularly Maharashtra, which is much below the highest yield, but large parts of central India, which are growing wheat. The average yield is 30, 40% below what is being uh, achieved even within India on farmers fields i'm not talking about yields in labs or in agricultural field stations now what um, jaraman and mana have done is they've done a simple calculation if the average yield in a particular agroclimatic zone came up to the highest yield in that zone so we're not comparing an arid or semi-arid region with an uh, irrigated or humid region, but within each agroclimatic zone, if the average yield could 
come to the level of the highest? How much would there be an increase in production? And if you just look at these, this last column, from the base year production of 100 million tons of rice, we would have 200 million tons, the same area and just the yield gap being closed within each agroclimatic zone. And in the case of wheat, we'd go from 109 to 100 million tons. In fact, in my view, and we wrote a paper on this many years ago, when there was a big question about land, uh, agricultural land being taken away for industry in West Bengal. Some of you may be familiar with that story, and which is happening in many parts of India as demand for urban requirements for housing for industry. Uh, we had done a calculation that if you could increase yield in some districts, not all, you could actually take away 1 million hectares of rice growing land in West Bengal without making any change to production. So I think this is something that we have to think about because we are going to have demands for industry, we're going to have demands for housing, and to say that all agricultural land is sacrosanct and cannot be touched. I think that is not very practical or realistic. But marginal lands, lands which are not very high yielding, can be re reallocated to other purposes without affecting aggregate production uh, because the yield gap is very, very large. A few more minutes is just Although we talk a lot about rice and wheat, I realize that increasingly we need to talk about other crops, particularly from the point of view of nutritional security. It may come as a surprise to you that last year, 2019, the FAO State of Food Insecurity Report estimated that 58% of South Asians it's probably a little higher among Indians, could not afford a healthy diet. And going forward, if we want to increase dietary diversity, increase fruit and vegetables and pulses and fats and oils and animal proteins and a lot of other things in the average Indians, uh, we are going to have to address the yield gap for non-cereals, uh, which is also very large. As I've just been in Kerala, I thought I will give you, just as an illustration, uh, the yield gap for coconut, which is a very important crop for oil and for many other direct uses for cooking. And you can see that even at the average yield in Kerala is 36 coconuts per palm per year with a potential of 200. It's the neighboring state of Tamil Nadu, it's 68 nuts. And the average yield of Vietnam is twice that of India. I haven't put it here. But so there's a huge potential for increasing productivity. And before I turn to the next issue, which is income and the problem of low incomes, I think I would like to end this section by saying that it is not possible to improve incomes unless there's also an improvement in production and productivity. So I think that has to be uh, taken into account. And unfortunately, our agricultural R&D and education and extension budgets have been shrinking year by year. Uh, they have shrunk even in this post-COVID pandemic budget. The government and the as many other governments in uh, many parts of the world has been on a path of fiscal contraction or consolidation for the entire decade, the last decade. Just put two numbers here for those who are interested. Uh, the share of expenditure on agriculture is declining. And within that, the share on agricultural research and education is, is minuscule. It's 0.2% of the total agricultural expenditure. So these problems, uh, can be addressed, uh, but they would require, clearly require, increased public expenditure and public investment. So I'm going to move on to something which I think 
is a very central to the discussion and the mobilization around the farm acts and that is a question of low incomes and when we look at incomes the three clear parameters are the production because uh, the gross value of output depends on output price, net of costs and there are three cost concepts that are frequently used in india cost a2 which refers to paid out costs or accounting costs cost a2 plus fl which is paid out costs plus costs of family labor and finally cost c2 which is really a kind of economic cost or all out cost as referred to literature because the implicit value of land machinery capital depreciation etc is included and what we see is that even and i think this is very important even for rice and wheat which are already the crops where there is some public intervention in the form of price support this graph uh, is for wheat you can see that the three cost concepts whether you take cost a2 a2 plus fl or c2 have been growing over the last five or six years at four or five percent per annum while the prices these are prices actually obtained by farmers realized prices are growing at three percent so the gap between costs and prices is widening and the same if you look at rice or paddy as we often refer to it the cost of production whether you take the simple paid out cost you include family labor or you include all other costs are growing at five percent or four percent annually whereas realized prices are growing at one percent so I think a large part of an understanding of what is happening in India today and why farmers are protesting is clearly visible from these two charts showing that the costs of production are rising much faster than the realized prices. And if even when we take crops which have a support price, we have this concept of a minimum support price uh, it is the price at which the government assures purchase uh, the minimum support price is not although it's announced nationally it's not effective in all parts of india it is effective in some states as you will see from these charts but this is the minimum support price for rice and you can see that it just about covers the economic cost, which is the blue line. Now, there has been a strong demand for about 10 years now that what farmers or cultivators need is not just to cover their costs, but they need some kind of return in costs because we've had surveys showing that youth are leaving farming and we need uh, farming is no longer viable and this is an agrarian crisis as i said the late 90s to 2004 that period which saw a severe decline in agricultural growth and uh, increase in uh, distress among the rural population uh, so there has been a demand that the minimum return should be 50 percent over cost c2 that is the green line and you can see that the minimum support price for rice doesn't cover this return, the C2 plus 50%. The situation is a little better for wheat. We can see that the minimum support price does cover C2 cost and in many states does cover C2 plus 50%. I think leaving aside these few crops if we take the all india picture and this is why as i said at the beginning you have support from large parts of india for the farmers protests it's only about one third even of wheat producers who are actually aware of msp so in the country as a whole 
it's only about 14 to 15 percent of rice and wheat growers who sell to government agencies at the minimum support price. And once you move away from this and a few other crops like sugarcane or, or cotton, you find that a large number of cultivators for a large number of crops uh, do not have any kind of floor price or guaranteed price available. Not surprisingly, when you look at these price and cost numbers, if you actually calculate the monthly income of agricultural households, this is the last national survey that we have, which is in 2012-13, you see that the average income of an agricultural household from all sources, so not just from agriculture, but from remittances or from pensions or any other source, was about 6,000 rupees or 80 euros at the 2013 prices. So that's really nothing. And even this, there's huge variation from Punjab to Bihar. And of this, only about half is from actual crop production. Now, I'm going to have to skip a little bit and it'll go a little faster now. But there's one point I want to make before going ahead. Uh, which is very relevant for this group of uh, researchers and that is that in India we have very little national statistics on income or expenditure or assets for the last decade. Since about 2011, 12, 13 we have do not have any information. There's a kind of block on data and that's an additional problem to understand what is happening uh, today, and particularly what is happening, say, after COVID. The last point I want to make, but very important, really, is that something that has been recognized for a long time is that that agricultural growth that we had in the second half of the 20th century, while remarkable in some way, was uneven across space, across time, across classes, and I will give a couple of slides, depending on time, to show that inequalities in, have risen. Uh, these are inequalities from official statistics. As I said, they all we don't have data beyond 2012. But whether you take consumption expenditure or income or assets or wealth, the Gini coefficient is increasing. And it's about 0.5 for income. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of numbers now from some village studies that we have done uh, with the Foundation for Agrarian Studies in Bangalore. And I'm just going to, there are a lot of villages and we can discuss this later, or those of you who are interested, I can discuss this uh, personally later. Inequality in the most important asset in uh, rural areas when you actually get accurate data, if you just look at what this is showing you is eight villages, nine villages from different agroecological regions of India, and how much land is owned by the top 5% of households, the richest 5%, it's 40, 50%. And how much is owned by the poorest 50%, it is zero in some villages. And the first village which I've written here is actually uh, one of, a, it's a kind of green revolution rice village in uh, southern India, in Andhra Pradesh, high productivity of rice and so on. So this huge inequality, which is actually not captured in official statistics, the concentration of income and assets among the top 5% or top 1%, we are seeing the same kind of trends of concentration that we are seeing in many other parts of the world today. And of course, in India, you have an added sort of a historical legacy of discrimination against caste. And you can see here again from the same villages, we've calculated the income for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe household. This is all for village level data. So Dalit and Adivasi households, and if you look at other households, without fail in every village, the mean income is much lower than that of non-Dalit non-households. So it's a systematic differential 
that we see, whether it's an irrigated village like the first one, whether it's an unirrigated village, whether it's a rice growing village, whether it's a wheat growing village and so on. So inequalities across households in terms of income expenditure, land holding, we have inequalities as between scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, and others. We have large inequalities across class. And we have done some analysis of socioeconomic classes, but today I'm just presenting something that is sort of uh, easier to discuss in a, in a, in a, without much explanation, which is small farmers and large farmers. As you know, small farmers constitute 85% of all households, farming households in India. So they're really the large majority. And again, if you look at the average income, net incomes from production, and these have been normalized per hectare, because obviously the large has many more hectares. Again, with one exception, and, I, and this I'll explain that, the average income of the small farmer is much is less than that of the large farm. And in the first village, it's actually negative. That's because these are tenants and they pay rent and they made losses from cultivation. So they had negative incomes when we did the survey. Now, what are the reasons for the differences between small and large farmers? We've discussed this in a book. So I'll just say one important conclusion we arrived at, and that is that the difference we found is not so much in yield, but the difference was in costs of production. Because of economies of scale, because of not owning machinery, because of renting in land, because of purchasing inputs on small scale rather than a large scale, for a variety of reasons, the costs borne by the small farmers are much higher than that of the large farmers. And that's what leads to this big divide in net incomes. It's not so much on the production side, but it's really on the burden of costs on the small farmer. So I would like to wind up because I think uh, I can expound on some of these things in the discussion. What I began by saying is that I think two very important or three important and interconnected problems of agrarian India today are that of low productivity, low incomes, and unemployment. There is a huge gap, current gap, between average yields on farmers' fields and potential fields, uh, which will, of course, be exacerbated by related factors in coming years, but we still have that gap that we can be met even if you don't account for climatic factors. In the last 10 years, I did not discuss this in detail, but I just said we've had an agricultural recovery. And very interestingly, even in this COVID year, in the last six months, the only sector of the economy which has shown a positive rate of growth is the agricultural sector. The first crop, what is called the Kharif crop, which is grown after the monsoon in June and harvested in November and December. It has been estimated that crop production grew at about 3% over last year. So this is really remarkable that even in the COVID year, agricultural sector has shown a positive uh, and rate of growth. But this rate of growth or the benefits of this growth over the last decade or more have been evenly distributed. Uh, and have benefited only a small section of cultivators. And as I've tried to show, inequality risen, be it across regions, across economic classes, across caste. And clearly, as we sort of go into the next 20, 30 years of this century, if we have to reverse um, this phenomenon, if we have to increase incomes, if we have to address the problem of inequalities, there's clearly need to reverse the whole trend towards fiscal contraction and 
should focus on agricultural science, R&D, and agricultural extension. Thank you very much. I am grateful to Kaushik, my student, for helping me put these slides together. And yeah, I, I'll, I'll end with that. And I'll leave you with this, which is a special issue of a journal, the review of agrarian studies on COVID and agriculture, a issue which uh, was brought out about a few months ago, which has, for those of you interested, how COVID has affected Indian agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Madura. I think that Madura's presentation has been very interesting, very full of data and of analysis on the situation of Indian agriculture. The presentation has left me with a couple of questions I would like to raise. Very, very quick, if we have enough time. After that, we give the floor to the participants in the lecture. The first uh, issue is, uh, the, first, the first question I would like to, to raise uh, refer to the fact that uh, it is very clear from what you have said uh, that in Indian agriculture there are major problem, problems related to the low productivity. Low productivity is uh, the key to understand what has been going on. Uh, and you, uh, or in your presentation refer to the reasons for low productivity, mainly to, te to technical reasons. And I would like to ask you if how, in, in your opinion, uh, institutional reasons uh, are behind, uh, ex might explain, might contribute to explain uh, the performance of productivity in different uh, uh, groups of Indian agriculture, of, uh, producers, of Indian producers. That is the, the first question, which is, in my opinion, relevant also to understand what is going on in India in this moment uh, in relation to the farmer protests. Uh, I've been reading around. In, in the press is very useful uh, to understand what is, going, uh, what is going around. But in any case, it left me, after having read many, many, many articles in all newspapers and magazines, uh, left, left me with uh, several doubts, uh, several, several questions about the situation as it is now. What I understand is that uh, what is going on uh, with the three acts that uh, the Indian government has uh, just approved is uh, a new step in the liberalization process that has been going on for a long time in agriculture culture starting from the last two decades of the last century uh, till very recently in the period 2000-2020 there have been other initiatives for liberalization. Uh, liberalization uh, has been presented as a way to reduce uh, the, the bad working of Indian agriculture. The, the point I understand that uh, the newspaper, the, the articles I've read in this period, uh, emphasize is that uh, due to, coll to coll collusion among tra traders, uh, traders uh, and uh, the interlocking of transaction with credit advances, regulation has been a major cause for low investments in agriculture. So the idea would be that if you cut these rules, this form of regulation, then you might increase, might increase productivity and, and so on. The first question, my, my first question is that I don't think it is so simple as uh, the, the press in India is presenting the situation. And another question, which is, uh, in my opinion, more strong, uh, my, a doubt which is more strong, is uh, a question related to the composition of farmer, uh, farmers who, who are protesting in this, in this period. What is, comes out from the press is that uh, agricultural workers are not part of the protest. They are not protesting. The protest is mainly done by farmers. Farmers, uh, which is a category which includes 
as you said before, large farmers and small farmers. My problem is to understand uh, how it is possible that uh, this uh, so heterogeneous group of uh, farmers uh, might find an unity in fighting against uh, uh, liberalization. What are the reasons why they are together and why they go on so strongly for a situation which, after all, is nothing more than a process, another step in a long-term process. Uh, one of the explanations I found, which I would like you to, to give an opinion on, is that they are not complaining because uh, of the, the, the matter of the intervention, but more on the method in which the, the initiative has been carried on. So they complain because the three acts have been uh, made by the government without consulting with their organizations. Again, this seems to me a very weak explanation. So I would like to have your opinion on, on that because I think that after more than three weeks, three months, uh, you know, we need to understand better what is going on, which is, is not clear. As an observer from outside, from Italy, so uh, that is my, my question to you. And after that, uh, I'm ready to collect all the questions that uh, will be asked to you. I mean, just to clarify, Elisabetta, when you said institutional reasons for the first question, uh, reasons. I don't think that technical change. I explain what. Ah, uh, uh, no. oh, you no. made it in that. Okay, okay. Yeah. I don't think okay. that technical reasons might explain what the, the, the backwardness of Indian agriculture. I think more that, you know, Indian agriculture has had several uh, period of strong technical change. But as you said, the technical change has not improved the condition of all farmers, but only of a group of, of them, of part of them. So there must be uh, institutional reasons. Which is the factors as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I think, let me uh, give an answer to the second set of questions, which are actually <laughs> yeah. huge. It will link up with institutions also. And one of the sub things that uh, surprised people is that, of course, it started with the better off big farmers of Punjab and Haryana and Western Uttar Pradesh. They were in the lead. And it is very clear in their case that they have much to lose. Because as I showed in my graphs as well, that um, Punjab and Haryana are the few places where the uh, MSP actually covers a C2 cost. There's also a system in place. There's a marketing infrastructure. Uh, there's a system of middlemen, uh, there's public procurement, and all farmers, I mean, villages we studied, we found you could be having five acres or 50, everybody gets the official minimum price. So although the larger benefit is going to the bigger, in uh, large parts of Western UP and Punjab and Haryana and some other parts of India, like parts of Andhra Pradesh and so on, uh, and Tamil Nadu, Kerala for rice, where the system is in place, cultivators of all sizes have benefited. Though, of course, the proportionate benefit is more. So a threat to this is now seen as it's a bigger loss for the large farmers but it is clearly going to affect everybody. In fact, what is very interesting is that middlemen and traders who normally, as, as those who are making money out of producers and you know, they're they are taking off a part, in Punjab, in this struggle, they are very much at the forefront because if a large corporates come in and start direct buying of produce, I don't think they're going to immediately, but if they do, or there's contract farming directly between say a company, like we have uh, PepsiCo is having direct contract farming for potatoes, for Lay's chips, the middlemen may be taken away. So even the middlemen are coming here and protesting. And again, to the surprise of many of us also, 
scheduled caste landless agricultural workers in Punjab are now protesting along with them. And the reason is that they see that whatever livelihood they get, whatever employment in agriculture they get, that could be at a threat if agriculture becomes less profitable. So the entire economy, rural economy of Punjab, Haryana and so on, which is around the production of uh, crops, the agricultural laborers are also, I mean, they are landless, they are exploited, but they are out there protesting now because they feel that if there is a you know, reduced profitability of agriculture in Punjab. That means a worsening of situation for them. So this is kind of a quite interesting uh, mobilization of some of the poorest class, those better off. So it's really something surprising, but something which has happened. The second thing is across India. Now, agriculture, marketing is a state subject. So what you said about method, it's not just consulting with the farmers and their organizations. There have been no consultation with the states of India. We are a federal country with states and union territories and the central government. And agricultural marketing is a state subject. And now these laws have been passed by parliament without any consultation with the states of India. So there is a protest now from governments as well as farming organizations in other parts of India, because they think that in this way, today it may be one particular law, but tomorrow many other laws which affect them in their states could be affected. So this whole method is very important, I think. And that's why you're seeing uh, such huge political support across India because people who are growing coconuts in far away Kerala, why should they support this? I mean, there is some solidarity, but uh, sustained support is coming because uh, the whole method that was used to uh, no consultation with elected governments in different states. Now, I think this links up to this point of liberalization that yes, on the one hand, you know, India, we did not, we failed with land reforms. At the same time, there is a large mass of small producers. There is increasing proletarianization, and yet many of them have not sold their land and given up and had gone, gone and joined the urban working class as yet. And that's because there's huge urban unemployment and there's rural underemployment. And that is the third challenge, which I could not uh, talk about today, but eventually has to be brought into picture. And the continued cultivation on what could not even be called small, but tiny plots of land. And you have been to Bengal and some places of India. It, it's, it's really tiny uh, uh, ownership and operational holdings of land. Is it viable in the long run? I think in, in my view, um, it is not viable unless we have some kind of collective form of agriculture so that we have some kind of economies of scale. And these, the cooperatives were tried, uh, they've succeeded as far as dairy cooperatives go, but they've not succeeded for other crop, other uh, so much. But new organizational forms are being thought of. There are some farmer producer companies, and in some parts of India, like Kerala, women's groups are now cultivating, entering agriculture. There's still a lot to be done, but I think we can have economies of scale brought in perhaps not necessarily collective ownership of land, but through collective ownership, say, of machinery or some, some forms of public support. And... Uh, I think that that is really a very important constraint, uh, institutional constraint, I'm, I agree with you, for small farmers. Uh, but at the same time, uh, given the limited opportunities for employment, whether it is in rural areas or urban areas, uh, we still have these 85% of households who continue 
to cultivate and one cannot just see them you know in such distress so immediate steps what will happen in 30 or 50 years uh, will there be uh, an institutional change to more larger units that that we have to see but i think for the next 10 or 20 years uh, these small farmers are there to stay and so we have to address questions of uh, their distress i think i'll stop here and then maybe we can come back later okay. can i pick up the chat questions is that okay yeah of course yeah you can do oh, that yeah. wonderful wonderful there are a couple of questions on agroecology and whether agroecology practices can increase productivity i think it's very important to define agroecology and unfortunately in uh, in india i don't know about how it is elsewhere but a large part of the literature which is talking about agroecology is anti science i don't see going back to traditional practices necessarily uh, not necessarily is not the way out at all yes we need we need new farming practices that are able to say uh, reduce pesticide use or we need farming practices that can uh, be tolerant to increasing salinity with climate change we need farming practices for nutrition rich crops as i talked about diversity of consumption which is very very important in india we have huge malnutrition and but these need in my view the latest in science i heard a lecture on gene editing a few uh, about uh, two weeks ago and there's huge leaps and bounds being made in terms of gene editing for salt tolerance drought tolerance uh, reduction in pesticide use reduction in fertilizer use so yes we have to learn from the mistakes of the past we need to look at soil health we have to be sensitive to climate and environment there's no doubt about it we have to ensure biodiversity but this is going to come from you know good application of science and it's not going to come from traditional practices in india there's uh, discussion of using cow urine for uh, in lieu of fertilizer and use organic farming and so on i think we've got to be very careful we are 1.3 billion people we have to feed our population and that's why i started with a 100 year graph after 50 years of colonial rule when we came out of it there was some achievements we were able to become self sufficient in food and i think it's very to lose that again so yes very very important environment and sustainability but please those of you who write about agroecology uh, please make sure the word science is there uh, now i have to start uh, going to the top to see the question one minute there is a question by isabaud uh, which you might uh, answer. The question is, in the current farmer protests, so which of the issues you have raised are prominent among their demands? Uh, so one thing is, right now in their demands, you'll see that continuing, well, there are three farmers acts, and the first one, which is about marketing, I think if you like is perhaps the most uh, important one in terms of demands because what it is saying is that no longer do you need will the public organized markets the agricultural produce uh, apmc markets be the main source of marketing for producers and private agents can buy these markets and the idea here is really the large private agents all private agents are not going to be able to buy in bulk from outside their own outside the already existing markets so i think the biggest and it's it's not a fear i think it's a very logical understanding uh, what elizabeth has said is that if we say that regulated markets markets which are uh, where taxes paid to the government are no longer markets through which transactions have to be done 
large private corporate players will come in and they are going to be allowed to negotiate prices directly with farmers. So when you have two sides negotiating, where one is a big multinational company, whether it's an Indian one or whether it's Cargill, and the other is a farmer producer, there's clearly no bargaining here. There's one side uh, is very one-sided. So that the prices will get affected. And that's as a result of this, slowly the regulated markets will close and the government will withdraw from public support and public pricing. So you will see repeatedly the talk about MSPs, the need to continue with minimum support prices. And the government has been saying, but our act does not mention the word MSP. And we've never said we're going to stop. But all economic logic points to uh, the slow closing down of the regulated markets and the move outside to private markets where the private sector will be allowed to set the terms and conditions for sale and purchase with, with any, without regulation. And the third act, the Essential Commodities Act, the weakening of that act is essentially allowing any amount of, or has removed the limits on maintaining stocks of agricultural commodities. Uh, let me put it the other way. Uh, there are limits on the amount of stocks of agricultural commodities that by private traders. And a very important point is India has a large private economy and large number of private traders, but there are limits on the stocks they can hold for the reason that in a crisis such as in COVID or any time when prices are shooting up, when there's inflation, the government can always control prices, uh, can manage prices. But if there's a large bulk of uh, stocks with the private sector, then the private sector will be able to manipulate prices. So this has been on the books for a long time. And the stock levels that have been removed are really meant for large corporate players. So I think the farmers see that, the, I mean, uh, the main demand, if you like, is sort of against the liberalization of trade in agricultural commodities and the opening up to the large corporate players, not to the small private traders. We have already a huge number of small private traders in India. It's to the very, very big players like say ITC and Reliance in India or Cargill or, you know, and so on, uh, uh, players from outside India. I hope that answers Isa's question. There is another another question which is uh, again on the protests, and the, the question is: But what do you think about the three farm laws? Protesters are from north, west, uh, probably middle and rich farmers from high yield, uh, wheat and uh, wheat and rice cane growing area. Why are they so apprehensive, and do they have any reason to be apprehensive? The question is by Stig Toft Madsen. Mad yeah, in my view, this, this is the three farm acts are a wrong step. First and foremost, as I said, because they have been just approved through parliament without any discussion, even in parliament, let alone with the states of India, where agriculture and agriculture marketing are subjects of the state. During the pandemic, uh, since last April, a whole lot of acts have been passed in parliaments. I think this has happened elsewhere. A whole lot of restrictive policies have been brought in uh, while all of us sit at home. The main point here is that, as I said, even the average income was 1,000 rupees a month or 80 euros at uh, 2013 prices for a farmer in India. It was thrice as much in Punjab. Okay, so it's, uh, it's uh, 200 euros. We're not talking about very large sums of money, except for a few. I would say 1% or maximum 5% of cultivators in India in pockets. Uh, so 95% are barely earning enough. So I think in a part of India 
where the system has worked and there's some assurance of price, I think rest of India sees a very clear message that if Punjab and Haryana are let down by the government of India, then there is no question of support to farmers of any product in any other part of India. So I think it's a kind of trickle down effect, if you like. People can see very clearly that while there's no doubt that Punjab and Haryana and Western UP farmers, I showed you some of those inequalities, are better off than farmers in some dry regions of Rajasthan or in other parts of India, in central India. They are, even in most farming communities in Punjab, the income that is being generated from crop production is not adequate. It is less than 50% of the entire household income. And it is essential for those farming households, I didn't have time to go into this, but we have numbers to diversify. In fact, in most Punjab families, one son or one daughter is used to be sent to the army, one son or one daughter is sent to England or Italy, so that they diversify income in different ways. So even with this public support, the income that is being generated is nothing large. It's, it's nothing huge. So if support for, if you like, those farmers who of the last, since the Green Revolution, since the mid 60s, have had public support, if that public support is taken away, uh, what is the hope for farmers elsewhere? And I think this is why you find people from who, all over India, from farming communities, uh, not growing rice and wheat or sugarcane who are also coming out in support. It's a ripple effect, if you like. They see what's happening here and they see that it's going to hit them eventually. Uh, there are two questions about uh, agroecological practices. I think one of them you have already answered, but there is a, uh, I, I repeat in any case. Could agroecological agro practices contribute to, to increase yields and the income in the long term? The first question. The second question is, my question is, does agroecology have any scope for increasing yield, assuming that increased yield can also have a negative environmental consequences? Uh, I think I address these questions that- Both, you have addressed yeah, both. Because, because going forward, um, Obviously, we need new technologies. There are problems with the old, and these new technologies have to be uh, sensitive, for example, to the water table, or sensitive to the chemical use, or sensitive to biodiversity decline. And uh, so, this agroecological, I find, is a very big umbrella. And uh, I often find that in the literature, agroecological, there's a tendency. Uh, to say that science is not important. And that is the point I wanted to emphasize. If it's science-based agroecology, I'm definitely, that's the way you know, to go. Uh, on this a set of questions on cooperatives, on other forms of organizations, and whether that will help, particularly help scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Now, scheduled castes in many parts of India have been historically landless. And therefore, I think for scheduled castes, the situation is a little difficult in the sense that unless there is first some kind of state intervention to make land available to them, whether it's land which is currently under public control or land which is surplus land or land which is not being utilized, uh, I think a route through agricultural prosperity in most parts of India, what I mean is through crop production, is not very uh, feasible because what is happening now is in India where we found Dalit cultivators, they're leasing in land, they don't own land and they pay such punishing rents that that's one of the reasons why they have such low incomes. So I think we need intervention in terms of identifying land which is currently not used but can be cultivated and making it available to scheduled caste households. I think in the case of scheduled tribes, it's a different problem because many do have land, 
but many of them, particularly the villages which are entirely scheduled tribe villages or Adivasi villages, what we call, uh, they are lacking even in basic agricultural implements. They don't have public investment in irrigation. They are backward if, you know, in many respects. So the problem of scheduled tribe villages, I think, has to be addressed in a slightly different way. I give one example from Kerala. It's very small uh, as yet and small scale, but maybe of interest is that women from some scheduled caste and non-scheduled caste uh, households have got together and leased in land at, at uh, zero rent because they lease in through the, through the local government, through the panchayat, and are cultivating and making profits from rice cultivation. So I think if access to land is made available, if there is control on rents that are charged by private uh, landowners, who are sitting in the cities, who are not cultivating land. So absentee landowners, if there can be another movement to identify land of absentee landowners and leasing it out to scheduled caste households on very low or reasonable terms, I think we can see changes uh, in income. So there has to be some kind of institutional support for uh, scheduled caste and scheduled tribe households. Another question. Will uh, we have, I think we have we have time for two more questions. Okay. Uh, will increased productivity solve the agrarian crisis? And there are other issues also related to high productivity. For instance, how that may may address environmental sustainability. Again, a question similar to others. Uh, so I, I think that um, uh, if, I mean, if you look at the examples, and I have studied, for example, in the case of rice, China or Vietnam, and uh, one of my students, Deepak Johnson, has recently studied, gone and done a village study in Vietnam and is comparing it with the situation of rice growers in Kerala, India. Why are Vietnamese cultivators having a much higher income than those growing the same crop in very similar agroclimatic regions in southern India? One of the reasons is higher yield. When you have more output, you can have, you know, you don't have to only focus on higher prices. The whole debate now, even I would say again, coming back to the Farmers Act in India, is focused around MSP because yields are stagnating. Total production is, is, is barely growing. So the entire focus is on prices. Increase productivity and at the same time, reduce costs by economies of scale. For example, um, if we really had uh, agricultural extension available, at the village level for the small producer. Many small farmers in India use fertilizers much in excess of recommended levels. So they're actually spending more and unnecessarily and uh, uh, neither useful for productivity nor for uh, uh, soil health. So if we actually had agricultural extension available at no cost or low cost at the village level, you could reduce costs and increase productivity at the same time. Uh, so I think the bottom line of what I'm saying is that in terms of making best farming practices, whether it is best seeds or it is a whole bundle of farming practices available at the village level, this can be more environment friendly, it can reduce costs and it can increase output. But this really in a country like India, this is not going to come from the private sector. It has to be, it has to come from public support. What can come and what has come from the private sector is investment in a few crops, investment in a few locations which are already highly irrigated, investment in a few uh, 
large farmers who can grow potato of the right quality for chips or tomatoes of the right size for tomato ketchup. So the private investment has come in India. It has come in uh, uh, particularly in ho uh, horticulture crops, but we see that that has inequalities. So if we want a more equitable path and we want economies of scale for the small, then we require some public uh, support. Uh, I don't think that uh, greater privatization is going to bring that. Duda, before we, we break off, could we also have your views on crop diversification and the possibility to expand the usual crop mixes? There's a lot of discussion about using pulses or alternative cereals like finger millet, for example, in parts of India. What is your, your view on the potential of um, these crops? Yeah, it's very important because we now import pulses. There are parts of Canada and Australia that grow pulses only to send to India. They don't consume them. So we have a shortage of pulses and very important sort of protein for most Indians. Uh, pulses and millets are largely grown in India in very dry, unirrigated regions. So these are among, when I said that the achievements of agricultural growth have been unequal across regions and crops, these have been neglected in the past. Uh, there is more attention being paid to them because we cannot expect producers to grow crops because they're needed for the country. They will grow crops if it's viable to produce them. And the low yield of millets, for example, is one very big uh, constraint on expansion. So again and again, I think if there's one message I want to say is we have to increase the budget for agricultural research and development because many of these nutritious crops, particularly pulses and millets, the average productivity we've had shown you the productivity gaps are even larger, but they are climate hardy, millets are climate hardy. And so we need more investment in developing the right, not just the seeds, but the right farming practices to make sure that the cultivation of these crops is viable. There's a demand for consumers for nutritious crops, but it has to be, uh, it has to give a minimum return to the producers. Thank you, Abbas. Thank you. Okay, um, unfortunately, all good things come to an end, so uh, we'll have to break off. Perhaps, Elisabetta, you would like to say the few closing words? Very quickly. Um, I would like to thank very, Madura very much because she has given a very interesting, a very useful presentation, uh, providing us with uh, a lot of information uh, deep on the working of agriculture in India. I'm very glad to have had the opportunity to listen to this presentation. I, I thank uh, on behalf of the ADI also the, all the participants, and I really hope to enjoy soon another uh, distinguished lecture from the ADI. Uh, thank you very much again and bye-bye to everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao.